Hello, hello, or oh, welcome back. It's Leading Women in Tech Time. I'm your host, Tony Collis, and today we are talking about the glass microphone. Stick with me here. <laughs> Stick with me. In the world of work, uh, especially a male-dominated workplace such as tech, many of us have heard of the glass ceiling, that invisible but very real barrier that we bump up against that limits so many of our advancements in the workplace. We realize one day, wait, hold on, all my male peers are advancing and I'm not what's going wrong. It isn't just me. That's the glass ceiling. We bump along underneath it until we figure out how to glide through it. I deliberately use the word glide. I don't like the word shatter. In that sense, glass isn't the right word. It's glass because you can see through it and you don't understand that it's there. But I don't think you shatter it because what I actually see happening is it hits us multiple times in our careers, that glass ceiling. And today I want to talk about something different, but equally impactful in a negative way. The glass microphone. Just as this glass ceiling hinders our progress upwards, the glass microphone stifles our communication. And if you've been around here long enough, you know that communication is everything for your leadership, your executive presence, your influence, your impact. It impacts everything you do and it dictates how good you are, how well respected you are. And it's intimately intertwined with that glass ceiling, which is why I'm calling it the glass microphone. Many of us don't even realize there is a barrier. We are just frustrated. We're not being heard. We're not being taken seriously. Our ideas are being dismissed before we've had the chance to fully explain ourselves. And we're wondering why people aren't listening to us, why they're shutting us down before we explain that the assumption they jump to isn't what I was talking about. Now, don't get me wrong. Men experience this shutting down mode as well. But what I see is it's happening more frequently with women for so many reasons, some of that we're going to be digging into today. But the real thing I want you to know up front is this glass microphone stifling your communication, stopping you effectively communicating what you're trying to get across, whether it's your value, whether it's your ideas, whether it's pushing back on somebody else's ideas, whether it's just saying, hey, take me seriously in some unspoken form or other, it costs our careers it ultimately causes stress and burnout. And it definitely is one of the contributing factors to the advancement of women compared to men. And that differentiator we're we're still seeing with the very real difference in how many women there are in leadership. And I think also a contributor to why women leave the world of tech because they're frustrated. They're burnt out and frustrated. So if you're going to break your own glass microphone, I first need you to acknowledge that you have a glass microphone and that communication is important. Now, you likely know communication is important, but do you realize how important? When we talk about communication, we're talking about how we speak, how we act, how we write, how we hold ourselves, how we show up on Zoom, how we write in emails, how we show up in Slack. Communication is more than just speaking. It is how people see you, hear you, interpret what you say and do and experience. Communication is one of my three pillars of leadership for a very big reason. It is a huge part of being a leader. It's a huge part of existing. Human beings communicate all the time. And when we face problems as women, we are often not being listened to or being taken seriously. Now, I often have people come to me and say they've been told they need to work on their executive presence or they're lacking confidence and they've been told that or they're frustrated that they aren't being taken seriously or they're getting feedback that they're missing the point when they're pitching to the executive team. They're either too detailed or not detailed enough or they're presenting the wrong data. The key commonality though is they're not being taken seriously. It won't be said in that sense so much, unless you're in a very toxic workplace. But there's this communication blocker that's holding you back. And people are offering useful insights, like you're lacking executive presence, but really it's not that useful. 
and it emotionally starts to pile up. You feel like you're being trodden down. You know there's something missing, but all the input you're getting from other people is just like, you need to work on your executive presence. You're not confident enough. Why don't you speak up more in meetings? Or you spoke up too much in meetings. Or that wasn't a good idea. Why did you say that? Why did you present that way? You gave us too much detail. So much of the messaging is contradictory as well, which damages our confidence. When we speak up confidently, when we're suggesting solutions, when we're following through on our ideas, we're overcoming the glass microphone. So if you're listening to this and like, I have no problem with how people interpret me, they always get what I'm saying, no issue with accepting feedback. I know exactly the feedback I'm receiving and what to do with it. I don't mind speaking up. I hit the mark in executive conversations. I don't have to fight my corner too much. There's a right amount of fighting my corner I have to justify, but not too much, then great. You don't have a glass microphone. If anything I said to you is going, well, yeah, there are situations this person just never hears me. Or whenever I'm asked to present to this group, they just shut me down. Or I don't like speaking up in this meeting. Or whenever I send this person an email, it lands like a lead balloon. Whatever. (laughs) If any of that stuff's resonating with you, then there's a likelihood that the glass microphone is going to hit you at some point if it hasn't already. When we exchange information because we're communicating, we're building connections, we're influencing others, we're driving change. And as you know, in tech, change is the nature of the industry and you should be part of that change. If you aren't delivering your ideas, if you aren't comfortable thinking on your feet because your brain goes into freeze mode, when you're in a room full of certain people, if you aren't confident navigating difficult personalities, holding strong on your ideas, building a strong team, inspiring others, whether it's through verbal, non-verbal, written communications, all of that, you are letting down yourself because you're not fully participating in the industry that I know, I know you want to be participating in. And We're in an era when some people are advocating communication is less important. We're in the era of AI. Communication is now something that can be done for you. AI can write your emails. AI can write your teamwork plans. It can tell you how to collaborate, how to innovate, how to problem solve, how to have a positive work environment. But as a leader, right now at least, maybe it will be different in five years' time. I don't know where this side of AI is going to go. Right now, Nobody can replace a great leader with great interpersonal connections, great strategy, great ability to articulate. And that vitality of a great communicator, a great orator, somebody who is inspiring, who's that inspirational leader that helps drive organizational goals and sustain growth. So you need to be able to clearly communicate. You need to be able to emphatically communicate. You need to be fostering a positive work culture and driving organizational success primarily because you're a great communicator. 99% of our responsibilities as leaders ultimately come down to our ability to communicate. It doesn't matter how great your idea is if nobody's listening to you. It doesn't matter that you're the only one seeing this opportunity if they shut you down as soon as you open your mouth. It doesn't matter if you're the one pushing the direction, if everybody else takes the credit. That one's a bit harder to stomach, but hear me out on this. One of the problems we have is a lot of the time we say to ourselves, well, as long as we take that direction, does it matter that I don't get credit? Yes, it does. It took me a long time to accept this. I would love it if we truly lived in a world where it didn't matter who got the credit. But actually, as humans, we do need credit. There is a human need. If we continuously don't get credit at all, it's not that we get credit indirectly. So as a CEO, I don't take the credit for what my team does, but ultimately I kind of get the credit because it's my company, right? So with your team, you might not take the credit, but there's credit due and everybody knows it because you're the leader of the team. But if instead your peers and other people are always taking the credit for you and your team, you are being seen, but not heard. And you're going to be perceived as timid or too aggressive. You're playing on a very unfair playing field and your contributions will gradually be less and less valuable, even though what you're saying today is being taken forward just by other people and you're not getting the credit. 
ultimately that causes more and more tension because if people, other people are getting the credit and you're not, you're going to be sidelined. You're going to be ignored. You're going to be overlooked and become less and less valuable. And that's before we get into fairness, right? (laughs) And so it's really, really important that we help you overcome the ability to hold your own in communication. Really, really important. And when we break through these barriers, when we learn how to hold our own, how to articulate our thoughts effectively, our communication often then surpasses our male peers. Because this is one of those ones where I say there's there's a silver lining to this double-edged sword, right? The double-edged sword is that we are held to different standards than our male peers. It is true. Don't get me wrong. There are male peers and some men listening to us, I know we have men listening to the show, will be resonating with what I'm saying other than being female, they will be saying, yeah, I don't do this. I don't do that. I don't get taken seriously. I don't get shoved into a corner. And they, yes, it happens, right? But on average, women are held to a different standard. And so we're more likely to experience this than men. Doesn't mean that men don't experience it. Doesn't mean as a woman that you do experience it. There, are, I'm hoping there are some of you who are going, yeah, this is not me. And please continue listening to this so that you understand some of the female, female colleagues around you who maybe aren't as comfortable with their communication as you are share this episode with them, do that for them, be the leader who understands what it's like for those women who don't have that natural ability that, or have done the work that you've done. Okay, great. And so if you're, if you're different, then that's, that's fabulous. But some men will experience it, but far more women will be experiencing this because of gender stereotypes, gender biases, the way we behave in in the workplace, the fact that when we're in a, in a group that's dominated by another uh, appearance than we are. So in this case, men, and particularly white men, you have stereotypes, you have bias, you have unconscious bias, which means that you have a higher level of prerequisites for gaining the same level of traction. But once you master it, you're going to have to do it to a higher standard than men. And that actually means the silver lining is you're going to quickly surpass your male peers. I say this so much the time. Executive presence is a classic one for this. We're held to a higher standard, but when we do get there, and you can totally get there, executive presence is definitely something you can learn. I teach it all the time. It's so foundational. It's so important. And when you get to that higher standard, you lift the entire organization up because you will find it so much easier to operate that way. And everybody else is thinking, gosh, if I just emulate how she behaves, I could do better. This is why I truly believe this is the diversity dividend, because whatever the underrepresented group is, whether it's women, whether it's you're an ethnic minority, whatever it is, yes, there's diversity of thought and experience. I think it's more than that. I think it's the highest standard. When you actually allow people to thrive who are from an underrepresented group, they have necessarily had to outperform. And if you actually allow them to thrive, it's because you're listening to them. You adapt, you you follow, you here and everybody around them has leveled up everybody and particularly the women who look like you so don't just do this for you do this for the women following along behind you okay let me get back on topic here when you want to break this glass microphone when you want to be heard more clearly what we need to be looking at is our emotional intelligence our adaptability and our resilience in our communication style I mean, I could talk about this all day, but like I see that as a large part of it. So your emotional intelligence is that you need to be very, very self-aware. You need to be self-aware and you need to be situationally aware. You need to be aware of when things are getting under your skin. You need to know that the situation unfolding is causing a negative response in you. You need to be emotionally intelligent enough to know that you're being very verbose when it's not being helpful. I do that one all the time, right? You need to know that you're giving lengthy explanations when actually it's not welcome or you're being too concise and actually it's there's an opportunity to improve. So you're emotionally intelligent because you're self-aware, but you're also situationally aware. You're aware that this audience needs more detail or less detail. You're aware how they're reacting to you. You're aware that you've lost them, that they're just kind of in a daze. You're aware of what they know and what they need to know. I always say to my clients, If you want to get somebody to point B at the end of a meeting, figure out what point B is, first of all. Don't walk into a senior leadership meeting without knowing what you want to achieve. That's point B. You have to assume the room is at point A at the beginning. 
You might want to do this one person at a time. It might be the whole group, but they're at point A. You need them at point B at the end of the meeting. Think through for each individual or maybe the whole group if they're very similar. What do they need to hear to go from point A to point B? Not what would you like to hear? You're not them. What language do they use? What expertise do they have? What keeps them awake at night? Figure out what is going to take them from point A to point B. Even better than that, figure out what the bump is in the middle that's stopping them just getting there. That's the kind of high level stuff that we do in coaching is trying to figure out those points in the middle that are really holding it up. But that's what your emotional intelligence is about. Your adaptability comes in because you're able to adapt. You're striking the right balance based on the information coming your way. You're providing enough details to instill confidence in your boss, your peers, your colleagues, based on the feedback you're getting. You're adapting. You're able to adapt your communication depending on what room you're going in. You don't always speak the same language. You don't always get the same level of information or the same kind of information. Remember, a fellow executive has never done your job, your team. You've done their job, probably, at least one of them, right? Depending on how high you are up in the hierarchy, right? Your peers and your boss, if you are a senior leader, have no knowledge of your own genius. Therefore, what they need to hear is very different from a peer who is very close to you technically or somebody below you. You will have inner speak in your team and external speak with other people in the organization and different conversations yet again with people outside the organization, including stakeholders. What keeps those people awake at night is very different. What keeps your clients awake at night is different from what keeps your founders awake at night, what keeps your CEO awake at night, what keeps your team awake at night, or what keeps your investors awake at night. Some of them will have similar expertise, but they need different language because of what they care about. When you're adaptable in your communication style, you prepare for the right kind of audience. Instead, what many of us fall into the trap of doing is overloading with excessive information, that unnecessary critique and overanalysis. And I spoke a couple of episodes ago about not sounding too clever, (laughs) not using buzzwords, avoiding throwing in too much jargon. It doesn't do you any favors once you get to the leadership level. It really, really doesn't. But sometimes we fall into that trap because we see our male colleagues doing that and getting ahead. And that's that double-edged sword I was talking about, those unfair levels. Men will get away with sounding too clever and nobody else really knowing what they're talking about. Certainly in some organizations, not in others, but men are more likely to get away with it than women because of that unconscious bias going on. When a man is saying that they know all these fancy things, it's in some organizations at least, harder to challenge it and people just just decide that they're very clever when a woman does it no we don't get away with it anywhere near as much we do sometimes don't get me wrong everything here is definitely a um spectrum that we're on but you need to realize that excessive information may lead to unnecessary critique and over analysis or when you use jargon people are just going to shut down and not give you the time of day And then the final thing is your resilience in your communication. Are you able to push back? Are you able to hold your own? Are you able to seek feedback and advice and accept it? Have that emotional resilience in order to accept that uncomfortable feedback and not get defensive. Do you recognize that you might not have the bandwidth or expertise to provide the level of guidance needed? Are you resilient to that? Do you seek out a coach or a mentor to help you target, get that expert advice and guidance. How are you being resilient in the way you're developing your emotional response to the situation? How are you being resilient in the way you're interpreting your communications? Are you being resilient in the way you're growing out of your comfort zone? When you address the challenges, make adjustments in your communication, you will break that glass microphone effect. You will enhance your career in in tech. No doubt about it. And I just want to take a moment to talk about the tailoring of communication to others one more time. This one is something I just cannot say enough because we just do not do it enough. I want you to be really thinking, what is the emotion this person is going through right at this moment? That's your emotional intelligence needing to turn on. How are you actively listening to them? Are you being attentive to their verbal and nonverbal cues? 
Are you able to adapt in the moment and be resilient to their emotions and your emotions in the moment? How are you tailoring based on what's coming your way? Are you practicing empathy? Are you putting yourself in their shoes, considering their perspectives before responding? When you tailor to the different individuals, you are showing a depth of an emotional intelligence that I just see is so missing in tech. It is there, but it's rare. When it does come, when people are able to adjust their tone, their language, their level of detail, when things are really resonating with the recipient, extraordinary things happen. And I've had the absolute privilege of working with women who do this. There are men that do it too, don't get me wrong. But the um, I, I've often thought to myself, there's a couple of clients I've had, I thought, if I'd had you as a boss, I would have stayed as a techie. These people are life-changing to everybody around them. So I want you to really work on nonverbal cues, body language, paying attention to cues to gauge how other people are reacting. And I want you to practice adjusting. You want to be looking at how you're maintaining eye contact. You want to be looking at how you're opening up your body language. Are you mirroring the other person's gestures and enhancing rapport and understanding? Are you providing opportunities for significant interactions with people that maybe are a little bit out of your comfort zone, like key stakeholders? Are you taking that time to assess that you're at A, you need them at point B, what's the thing in the middle, point C that they're not getting through? Are you honing your emotional intelligence? Are you looking at all the time, how could I have done this better? I love to get my clients to ask themselves at the end of the day, what went well today? What didn't go well? What do I wish I'd done differently? It is such a great tool for saying, could I have done that better? It won't always be your communication. Once you've broken the glass microphone, it won't be communication for a while. It will be something else. But what I see, same with the glass ceiling, is you'll you're hit it again at some point. You're always going to be up leveling in your career. I've taken public speaking classes and I still think there's massive room for improvement in my communication. But there's other things that are more important for me to work on right now. But I know it'll come round again. We're never done growing. Have a look at how quickly you're able to respond. Are you confident in your responses? Have you got that think on your feet ability? I have a think on your feet formula for a reason because it's hard for many of us to do effectively rather than missing the mark or just shutting up or sounding like a bit of an idiot. Thinking on your feet really, really well is challenging. If you don't know how to think on your feet, my short version of this formula is focus on how you generate your ideas. If they come in the moment, if they come afterwards, if they come afterwards, you need to shrink down the time gap between when you wish you had the idea and when it actually arrives. And that's about giving yourself self space after every opportunity when you want the idea. So shrink the time gap between, yeah, I need the idea him, but it arrived two days later, whatever it is. So get the time, get, get the idea at the right point. Then work on how you're going to articulate those ideas, pitch them in effective ways, and then work on your confidence to actually speak up and read the room. Three steps. There's a lot more to it than that. But that's the foundation of my think on your feet formula. Anybody can learn how to think on their feet and do it extraordinarily well, but it takes the time to build that skill through practice, through staying informed with current trends and developments, and through working on that effective communication. The other thing I want to point out here with effective communication is that less is more from the not more. For those of us, myself included, who are brimming with ideas, it's good to remember to slow down, focus on one thing at a time. Select a single idea to advance, get that buy-in, pause and follow through. If you are struggling with a glass microphone and everything else I've said is not resonated with you, it may well be this one. You may well be a million ideas a minute kind of girl like I am. And honestly, having been the person on the receiving end of that kind of person, it's exhausting. Be the solutions person, not just the problem person, the person pointing out all these opportunities. They become problems. You might also be the problem person, the person saying all these things are going to go wrong. And that's a very valuable thing up to a point. The problem is when you're surrounded by that kind of energy, it's exhausting. Instead, you want to identify the single most important issue, maybe a couple more, but ideally just one and offer constructive solutions. Ideally suggest which is your preferred favorite and why, and then be proactive in following through. 
Be the person that drives the change. Don't share the idea and then say, not my problem. Be the person who follows through on ideas is critical in their ability to provide solutions because they don't just provide the problem and the solution, but they actually see it through to completion. Even if you're not the one that does the work, see it through. Set goals, create action plans, stay committed to seeing it through. Follow through with how the team around you can accomplish this instead of dumping a million ideas a minute. The most important thing here though, that I really want you to hear, because it's the thing I see the most, so many things I see, but the thing I see the most Don't be afraid to speak up, but always make sure you are articulating clearly for the organization in front of you. Make sure they know what you're really trying to get across. Make sure they understand. If they don't understand, that's on you, not on them. Yes, they don't understand you more than others because of biases against you, them not paying full attention, but you can overcome this. You can. You've got to do this for you, but also for the morale of your team. As a leader, when you speak up, it's really your team speaking up. You are saying, listen to me and my team. Your team gets a morale boost. They get motivation because they know they're represented well. You need to make sure your team is represented. You need to make sure your team is aligned with where everybody's going. If you can do all that, you will break the grass microphone. You will advance your career. You will be overcoming the barriers that we're seeing, hitting so many of us. And you can be the one that shows the women coming along behind you how to do it. If you found this useful, please do share it with another woman in tech who needs to hear this today. So many ideas I've shared with you here. There's so much more to this, but hopefully it gives you a little inspiration for making a small change that might just change the direction of your career for the better. Until next time, remember, stay in your tech leadership game, follow your dreams, because the world really does need that uniqueness that you bring as a leading woman in tech.